good morning. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Civita, uh, especially Eric and Bode, uh, for organizing this and giving us an occasion to shed some of our views on a very on a country which very few knew, know much about. Um, at Amnesty, I used to cover East Asia, so I used to cover South Korea, <coughs> Japan, uh, Mongolia, and North Korea. And each of these countries, uh, South Korea had amnesty membership, Japan had amnesty membership for over 30 years, and Mongolia had also uh, amnesty membership. But North Korea, we would have been very worried if we had any membership, and that kind of shows the problems we have with North Korea. Um, we have, oh, I'm also part of a great panel, uh, so being uh, the person to kick start, I thought um, I'll briefly say, I'll be talking in, you know, introducing you to some of the issues uh, uh, relating to the human rights concerns uh, on North Korea, and then uh, also that I try to do it uh, in an easy way rather than listing all these boring uh, details. So I'll do it with how we conducted the campaign in Amnesty, uh, where I'd worked for uh, about 12 years. I left uh, early this year. And, uh, and then in my panel, there's uh, Michael will be talking about solutions and his alliance. Uh, which is uh, a new organization, and then Sokil will be talking about life within uh, North Korea and how it's changing the markets and how the situation, it looks like a plain, you know, calm water, but there's a lot of change within. And, uh, and of course, Ji Hyun will be the insider who's been through it all. The three of us are outsiders looking in. And actually, we are hoping that through this, uh, you know, we'll get more people looking into North Korea. Um, and also, yes, um, as uh, Eric mentioned, I had, as part of Amnesty, contributed to the creation or the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry in the UN uh, last year. And they submitted a voluminous, about 400-page report in uh, February uh, this year. And then since then, it's, it's still early days, but basically now it's the implementation stage. And we have, they have a set of recommendations. And it's quite a historic a milestone, a historic document. So I'll also talk about that. So I'll try to do it in about 12 minutes. Um, I'll keep my watch. So <laughs> what, what I'm really surprised is how uh, so many of you, you are here. I'm not a morning person, so you know, uh, I kind of thought you know, Norway's midnight sun and things like that. But I'm really happy to see you all. Uh, we're talking about a very difficult subject. so. If uh, you have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask us later. Um, so yes, um, when I uh, joined, uh, my connection with North Korea is very, in a strange way, personal. I went to South Korea to study. And it was for a personal reason. I wanted to, I am originally from India. And I wanted to go to a country where there were no Indians. So it didn't make a difference if I had been in North or South Korea at that stage. Uh, I was in the South. And uh, to improve my Korean, I stayed, uh, my landlord was uh, South Korean uh, in his 70s. But he had come from North Korea, and his story was very uh, touching. He and his brother had crossed the border uh, for market, into market and to go to the market, and then the war broke out, and they never saw their family again. So, um, and this uh, separation is something which actually marks uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. And... Um, so you have this uh, satellite image of, uh, you know, a lot of light in South Korea and North Korea being very dark. And that's a classic image these days we use. And in the human rights perspective, it's even darker. That's a problem. There's not many, uh, not much work done or even that has been done. It's, we do not have access. So the information that we get is from courageous survivors like Ji Hyun, who managed to leave North Korea and then have the courage to speak out. And they'd often do it at great risk because, as you can imagine, their families or their friends are at risk because North Korea practices what's called guilt by association, the Yun Jua J system. And so they could punish their friends and relatives. Okay. Um, in Amnesty, the first uh, that I can recall was a 1979 report. Uh, it was basically a testimony by a Venezuelan poet called Ali Lameda, who, you know, because he was leftist, he went to North Korea to help translate the Spanish uh, bit for the propaganda. And he and a French man called Eric Sedilot uh, both were caught criticizing the government in the 60s, and they were both 
warned. They didn't listen, so they were eventually uh, detained in a uh, political prison camp for years. And uh, it was due to international pressure. I believe um, it was the Romanian president, Ceausescu, who played a role in his release. It's a bit strange, if you think about it. Uh, but I in any case, uh, uh, with uh, Ali Lamada, he managed to leave the country. Eric Selilot unfortunately died because of his illnesses, uh, caused because of his treatment that he received or suffered in the uh, detention facility. And uh, Lamada's uh, testimony actually rings true even today. Because he talks of long hours of forced labor, uh, tough quotas, work quotas. If you did not fulfill it, you and your team uh, were denied food. Uh, you uh, were often um, tortured. You had self-criticism uh, sessions. Uh, often prisoners beat each other for admitting to mistakes um, and also deaths. Um, and this was uh, in 1979. And since then, uh, there was reports that Amnesty did on executions, on abductions, um, um, on, on uh, the, the uh, enforced disappearances, mostly of um, Korean-Japanese uh, nationals, because uh, there's a large uh, North Korean, or rather Korean community in Japan, who have a lot of ties with, uh, uh, with, with North Korea. In fact, the present leader, Kim Jong-un's mother, is actually uh, Korean-Japanese. Um, so, uh, they, they've had some very powerful people, but also a few who, like Ali Lamada, criticized, ended up in prison, and, or in some cases, got uh, executed. So, these were cases that Amnesty took up. And then, in the, as more information came up, um, um, there were also a few opportunities which opened up. In 1991, the International Parliamentary Union uh, convened a session in Pyongyang, and Amnesty was invited there. Um, and then there was another uh, uh, visit in 1995, specifically to talk about human rights violations. The North Koreans, of course, denied everything. Uh, and um, the, the cases of uh, executions that we specifically raised, um, they said that all these people had either died of natural causes, they never produced anyone. And then they did not, I think they had only a meeting with one person whom we had requested. And there was a visit to a uh, prison facility, but I was not there. My predecessor said that it really, paint, uh, you know, there was a smell of fresh paint. And uh, the only good thing was we felt at least the prisoners would have some new rooms uh, or some better, you know, painted rooms. Um, but after that, uh, there was a report Amnesty did on the forced labor of North Koreans in the Russian logging camps. And, um, and since then, when I joined, uh, we had heard that North Korea had uh, suffered a very uh, uh, disastrous uh, famine in the 1990s. And uh, that, it, that food crisis still continues. Uh, the UN agencies, the World Food Program, and the World F and Agricultural Organization, I think they still provide uh, food aid to about two million, uh, mostly children and, year and women. Um, but at one stage, they were feeding nearly a third of the population in the 1990s. Um, and so we decided to initially look at the North Koreans in China. And that was my first report in 2000. And then uh, after that, we looked at the, our concerns on uh, the increase in human rights violations because of the food crisis. So we kind of linked the two together. So for instance, you know, those uh, who were looking for food crossed the border because they had no food available in their country, and how uh, once they were forcibly returned back, all of them faced torture, some of them were executed, uh, many of them died of starvation, or, uh, you know, all of them uh, faced ill treatment of the worst kind. And, uh, and, and of, of course, many of the people who crossed the borders were uh, women, so many of them were subjected to trafficking. So uh, there were many areas that we considered, uh, and, and also this overwhelming issue of um, the government not doing enough to feed its population, uh, which, which uh, is still the case. And then later we also looked at the health crisis as a result of the food crisis and how the government again is not doing enough. Um, we had a bit of a problem with the World Health Organization, which I'll tell you later, uh, because of that report. Um, but after that, we used, uh, you know, the North Koreans refused to engage with us. Uh, I have had a few meetings with the North Koreans diplomats in Geneva, because they deal with human rights. 
issues, and um, it's never been easy meeting them. Um, and the the um, what we then did was because the North Koreans continued to deny access to us, we also thought let's do some campaign with this personal because with food crisis and with health, it was the situation, not people, and we are a campaigning organization. So in 2011, that was Amnesty's 50th year. Uh, so we did a campaign to close political prison camps. Uh, and we focused on one camp, the camp at Yodok, which is camp number 15. And because most of the uh, um, people we'd interviewed, about 20 of them, uh, most of the North Koreans who were in South Korea uh, uh, came from Yodok. And, uh, and, you know, we also decided since the North Koreans do not, uh, they say these camps don't exist. So we use satellite images to prove that these camps exist. We got testimonies to prove, you know, uh, these people would tell us what these uh, camps, what they meant to us. So we had both looking from above and from below. And also we focused on one particular case, the Okil, Ogilnam family case, where Ogilnam actually uh, defected. He was a South Korean who went to North Korea with his family. They found the situation very bad. They spent quite a bit of time in a rehabilitation center, a detention facility. Uh, when he got a chance to uh, leave North Korea, he defected, and his family ended up in a political prison camp. Uh, and so we raised this case. Um, um, and and um, the Amnesty members, it was the most successful campaign. That year, I think we got 170,000 uh, people writing. And so we thought, this is something we really need to focus more. Um, and that, that same year, there was also 40 NGOs, uh, including Amnesty, we joined together. And we started uh, what's called the International Coalition to Close, uh, to Stop Crimes Against Humanity in North Korea. So it's a big title, um, but it's basically ICNK. And ICNK uh, and Amnesty, we lobbied the United Nations to get uh, a, a commission of inquiry into place, um, given the international increasing international concern. Uh, also, this was, the international concern had been growing because it was 2003 that the first human rights resolution expressing grave concern was first expressed in what was then the Commission, of Enquir Commission on Human Rights. It's now the Human Rights Council, and there have been nine years straight that they've expressed serious concern on the widespread, systematic, and grave concerns of human rights violations. And also since 2004, there's a special rapporteur who's been uh, looking uh, at North Korean human rights. Um, so with the Commission of Inquiry, um, um, I've just got two minutes, so I'll better <laughs> rush. Um, with the Commission of Inquiry, the, what was interesting was last year, our, uh, um, we were very successful because in the vote that the Human Rights Council f passed to establish this Commission of Inquiry, it passed without a vote. Uh, in fact, ironically, the one country which uh, protested, and I call it ironic, was Venezuela because <laughs> Ali Lambada was from Venezuela. <laughs> but, um, um, you know, the geopolitics of the whole thing is different. The Commission of Inquiry um, um, included the Special Rapporteur, Mr. Marzuki Darusman from Indonesia. There was the he it was headed by Michael Kirby, who is a retired judge from Australia, and uh, Sonia Bizerko from Serbia. So we had a good panel. And they basically didn't want to stay too long. They just took one year, actually less than a year. They had a good secretariat. We briefed them. I testified in their first uh, uh, public hearing. They did a series of public hearings in Seoul, in Tokyo, and in London, and in Washington, DC. Uh, we also, uh, and all of that is available on the web. So if you ever want to, if you have a few hours to spare, or minutes, you can go to the UN web, the Office of the High Commissioner, and it's all available there. But what's historic about the uh, report is that they found that the situation of political prison camps and detention facilities uh, constitute crimes against humanity for the first time. They also say that uh, the policies that the North Korean government has taken, or rather not taken, because of which the famine and the food crisis still continues, uh, that denies the basic uh, right to food, and that also constitutes crimes against humanity. They also said that the actions taken against subversive thought, people, North Koreans who have subversive thoughts, or who are, uh, you know, Christians, uh, uh, those actions also constitute crimes against humanity. 
They also say that those people who flee or leave the country, North Korea, and actions against them are also constituting crimes against humanity. They also talk about abductions, the ones in Japan, Japanese nationals, South Korean nationals. There are thousands. And uh, this also constitutes uh, crimes against humanity. And so this is historic because the first time you have a UN body calling, saying very, very clearly that this is crimes against humanity, and they call on the UN General Assembly to refer to the Security Council, and that's where it is at the moment, where then it's to refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court. Um, the commissioners, after the report came out last month, um, visited New York. They had a discussion at the Security Council. They briefed them. It was an informal meeting. 13 of the 15 members met, um, and of whom I'm told nine of them were favorably, you know, they, they, they kind of committed to follow up the uh, the recommendations implemented. The problem is that the two countries who absented were China and Russia, <laughs> who are expected to veto. So I think it's now up to us, the international community, and that's why I'm standing here, to, because uh, what the Commission of Inquiry concludes is that the government of North Korea has shown that it is not doing anything. In fact, it's perpetuating. It is you know, committing crimes against humanity. So it's the responsibility of the international community to do something. And one way is to express this political will to get the UN General Assembly, get the United Nations Security Council to refer individuals, to refer institutions, to refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court. Um, interestingly, this uh, commission, uh, commission's report was um, you know, uh, supported fully in the, 2000, in the March Human Rights Council resolution. And then in April, there was a, you know, you know, the, what we call the universal periodic review. And what was interesting is that this was the second time North Korea came up for review uh, in May. And um, the first time North Korea historically refused, as they did not accept a single recommendation, e even friendly ones. And that put the whole universal periodic review process under question. This time they have agreed to consider 185 of the 268 recommendations. Of course, what they are rejecting are access to uh, the commission, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the special rapporteur, uh, and also uh, not to follow up on the recommendations of the commission of inquiry. I think I've taken too much time, so I uh, <laughs> can see Eric kind of you know, gnashing his teeth. But um, I'll, um, uh, you know, if you have any questions, I look forward to it. I hope I've given you a few ideas, and um, I thank you too. You, Eric. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank Michael Glendening, please. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome on this beautiful, beautiful day. Um, I'm going to talk about s solutions. Now, sorry to tell you right from the start, there are no easy solutions to the problem that is North Korea at all, in any way, shape, or form. Now, before I get into that, I'd like to explain a little bit about who I am and who, my, who I work with in this organization, um, the European Alliance for Human Rights in North Korea. Now, we set this up about a year ago, which you know, you'll hear from Sukil from Liberty in North Korea. They've been going for over 10 years, Amnesty, what? 60s, 70s? Yes. Mm, so quite some time. Now, we're the, the newcomer, if you like. Now, we set this up to kind of get a network of concerned individuals and organizations which work on specifically on North Korea. Now, before we started last year, there really weren't any across Europe at all. And now we have three organizations. One is in Norway, one is in Germany, and one is in the UK working with us to kind of localize the North Korean human rights issues and keep it on the agenda across Europe. Um, and we decided to focus across Europe for many different reasons. Most of them are about policy, unfortunately. Um, we've seen a significant first step in attempts to tackle the human rights crisis in North Korea with the COI, which you heard from rather eloquently from Rajiv all about. Um, and that COI Commission of Inquiry is useless without further action. So what can you do? 
The first thing, of course, is to keep it on the agenda in Norway. Contact your MP, contact your local politician, and just keep sending them emails, letters, and keep reminding them to make this part of the agenda whenever there's this diplomatic discussions between Norway and North Korea and Norway at the UN. Now, I've been doing that with my own politician, my own local MP, and I'm pretty sure he's really, really tired of hearing from me you know, every week, you know, just reminding him. But it is having some impact. I've been monitoring his activities in the UK Parliament, um, and he's been signing all kinds of um, bills and stuff like that. So it is having some impact. Small though it is, it is keeping it on the agenda. And the other thing is a little bit kind of different, and I, I know it doesn't exist in Norway right now, but in the UK we have um, the, the all-party parliamentary group on North Korea, which is a formal organization made up of politicians from right across the spectrum, left, right, center, you name it, they're all in there. And they're working on North Korea as a general, you know, security issues, human rights. But they've held and continued to hold several prominent events in London on North Korean human rights. We've had, um, we've had Jang Jin Sung recently, who was a North Korean propaganda and uh, counterintelligence official. He defected in 2004 and he's just released a book. He came and talked there. Ji Hyun, who you'll hear from later on. She's also talked at the parliament. And that's what I'd like to encourage you to do, whether to write to your politicians and encourage them to set up either a formal or informal group of politicians to keep North Korean human rights on the agenda at all times, uh, because it isn't happening across Europe at the moment, and it should be because it's the most dire human rights situation in the world. <laughs> now, so I'd like to move on and talk about what constitutes good policy and bad policy to North Korea, and I've said already, there are no easy solutions at all. But good, just generally speaking, good policy socially, economically, psychologically, and politically empowers the people of North Korea. Bad policy entrenches the status quo. And that's where we are at right now. And you'll hear more from Sukhil about the changes in North Korea. And it's important to stress that North Korea is has changed, is changing, and will continue to change. Not at government level, they have no desire or want to change right now, but the people themselves, there is, you'll hear extensively from Sukhil about the mar grassroots marketization, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we support those changes? One, freedom flow. Uh, the media landscape in North Korea is the most repressive anywhere on earth. Um, accessing foreign media, can and does lead to uh, sentences in political prison camps and on rare occasions, execution. Um, so it's really, and obviously, there is no real bridge between the outside world and the regular person on the street in North Korea. And one thing that we've been doing as an organization is campaigning for the BBC World Service to establish a Korean radio broadcasting service. Um, unfortunately, due to Britain's rather farcical um, politics and policies towards North Korea, they'd rather maintain diplomatic access, because we maintain an embassy in North Korea, they'd rather maintain that at, rather than annoy the North Korean government by establishing a service. And we know that's not the reality. The reality is by establishing a service, you're not going to annoy them that much, really. There's nothing that they can do about it. So supporting freedom of information is something we can do quite easily. And that's not just radio. It's USBs, it's DVDs, it's um, computers. There are millions of computers in North Korea now. And all of these things are increasing the flow of uh, outside information into the country. now. There have been all kinds of things going into the country that previously weren't books about the Korean War, what really happened in the Korean War, because obviously the North Korean narrative is grossly different to the reality. We've seen uh, Sex in the City was really popular for some time. God knows why, but it was popular. Um, and other things like that are 
gradually getting into North Korea. So good policy will ensure that that freedom flow continues. Uh, another good way of solving some of the problems are support of the grassroots marketization. Now, I'm not going to say too much because Sokil will talk about that extensively, but North Korea is not communist. It's, we have seen complete capitalization, complete capitalist society. Now, there is it's very much a mixed market economy, um, and you'll hear more about that in a while, but yeah, I won't say any more about that. Um, the third thing I would say would be cooperative efforts across Europe on North Korea. Now, we aren't seeing that now. Of course, every country has their own um, way of dealing with North Korea, and that's fine, but that's not helping solve the problems. So it's really important that we work across Europe, whether it's on one issue, so say campaigning on the political prison camps to close the political prison camps, if every country started pressurizing, then it's kind of hard for them to try and manipulate us. Or, alternatively, complementary uh, policies, things that work together but aren't necessarily the same. There needs to be greater uh, cooperation on these issues. And we've seen that kind of in Europe with the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry because Europe, along with Japan, were instrumental in making that happen. There was Nothing like that had happened before, and because of European countries and the EU and Japan, we saw that happen. So things can happen if we work together, but it's not happening right now. And the kind of last thing I'd like to say is about support of the refugee community. Uh, there are somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 refugees, uh, North Korean refugees, in Europe. Uh, I'm sorry to say I don't know how many exactly, because the UNHCR figures are not the same as the various government figures. And if you speak to the refugee community, those figures are different again. So really, we have no idea. But somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000. And worldwide, excluding China, there are about 30,000, 26, 27 in South Korea. And they're such an important bridge, and you'll hear more about that from Sukil, um, in terms of sending information in sending money into North Korea. Uh, the support, the inflow of information and the inflow of cash from the refugee community has helped transform the markets in North Korea greatly over the past decade and will continue to do so. But a lot of the refugee community arriving in Europe have problems with language. Very few of them come to Europe speaking any of the, langu any of the language of the country they're in. So even something as simple as that, setting up some kind of welfare project to teach them Norwegian, I know there are some North Koreans in Norway, um, and helping them assimilate into Nor Norwegian society better so that they can get better jobs and send more money home and accelerate the changes that are happening in North Korea. Um, change can happen, but only if in a multi lateral way. We must support that at every single level. Otherwise, we get sucked into uh, the situation at this, like in the six-party talks, which is six parties are Russia, China, South Korea, North Korea, the US, and Japan. And they've just been sucked into this political stalemate where um, nuclear issues are the only thing that matters, and human rights are ignored. And the human rights situation in North Korea will not get better until that's resolved. So we must start focusing collectively, individually, on the North Korean human rights situation. The nuclear situation will not go away. We must start to focus on the human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Sukil Park, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you all for coming, and thank you, of course, to Sivita for organizing what I think is a really important meeting. Uh, I think this is important because North Korea is an important issue, but it's very little known. And actually, one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons why it's very little known is because the North Korean government makes it structurally difficult to know their country. 
you know, I'm, a, I'm a partially a researcher on North Korea, and it's very hard for me to you know, even visit the country, use normal social science methods to try and understand the country. Um, so I think this kind of meeting is important to discuss what we do know and then take it forward to actual actions uh, that we can use to support the country, to support the people inside the country. So uh, one of the results of it being very hard for the international community and the international media to know North Korea is that there's several misconceptions about North Korea. And so I'm going to go through about four to five of those misconceptions and then see uh, what the significance of that is. The first misconception that I think is really important is that North Korea, this is the misconception, North Korea is all about Kim Jong-un and nuclear weapons. If you look at you know, the international media, or if you ask 100 people in the US, in, in Europe, even in South Korea, what they think of when they hear North Korea, it's basically going to be you know, crazy dictator Kim and nuclear weapons. Those are two massive symbols that dominate the discussion about North Korea. I'd go as far as to say that maybe Kim Jong-un is you know, possibly one of the most famous uh, leaders of any Asian country in the world. Kim Jong-un is maybe more famous than Xi Jinping, the leader of you know, 1.3 billion people in China. That's ridiculous, right? The, the, North, uh, the, uh, the leader of North Korea, 24 million people, probably has more recognition uh, than Xi Jinping and, and a lot of other Asian leaders as well. And then, of course, uh, the, the discussion is very securitized. It focuses on nuclear and, and missile issues uh, and this political level. The problem with that is that that level of international politics is very much a stalemate. If you look at the last 20 years, there's been fluctuation between provocations and negotiations. But basically, the approaches of DC, Beijing, Pyongyang have been very consistent. The policies have been very consistent. And so this stalemate, which uh, you know, results from this basically you know, irreconcilable fundamental positions, is very stable. It, you know, sometimes the international media makes a big issue of it, says that it's maybe unstable, but it's, it's proven itself to be stable basically over the last 60 years. So the misconception here is that th this is the most important thing. I say that that's a misconception because what I think is the most important thing are the 24 million North Korean people inside the country, North Korean society, not just because these are human beings living in very difficult uh, circumstances, but actually because these are the people that are driving the change. The change is not coming from the international level. It's coming from the, the level of North Korean society. The North Korean people are driving these bottom-up changes that are in economic changes, information changes, and social changes. And these changes are happening in ways that we can support from the outside world, as Michael mentioned as well. So I'm, I'm going to go through uh, a little bit more of that in the, in the next uh, misconceptions as well. The second misconception that Michael also mentioned is that North Korea has a communist or socialist economy. North Korea has a command economy. This was true, uh, and this was true to a remarkable extent up until the 1990s. North Korea had an incredibly demonetized and incredibly uh, centrally controlled economy uh, throughout the Cold War. However, for various reasons, various structural reasons, uh, you know, including, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, North Korea's state socialist economy collapsed in the 1990s, and that was basically the end of it. So, the, so for decades, the North Korean government had very much controlled the economy. Everybody basically worked within the state system, and then they got rations. You know, obviously, most importantly, they were getting rice from the government. In the mid-1990s, the government lost their ability to give rations uh, to the people. Basically, they went bankrupt. And so all of, all of a sudden, people had to fend for themselves. They started off just foraging, going into the mountains, selling what they could, uh, building up these kind of cottage industries, these private businesses, even inside their own homes. One example is that an, uh, a North Korean refugee lady that I know used to work in a shoe factory that was run by the government, of course. That shoe factory stopped working. The factory stopped giving her any rations, and so she took some of the supplies, some of the materials from the shoe factory, took it home, and started making shoes in her own house, and then was sell selling them on the market. That's a very micro-level example of how the state uh, economy stopped functioning and the private economy started functioning, resulting in a de facto privatization of the North Korean economy, so that now North Korea has a capitalist economy, not a communist economy, it has a capitalist economy. Not only does it have a capitalist economy, but this capitalist economy, which operates outside of the bounds of government control in a lot of ways, 
it's growing. It's growing over the last 10 years. And so that's really significant. The government has lost control of the economy, and that economy that it's lost control of, this grassroots capitalist economy, is growing, it's actually improving, it's empowering the North Korean people. So, like I say, uh, that's, that's an important misconception. North Korea has a market economy. Once those markets went in, the government could not take them out of the country, and this has a long-term, uh, you know, very important long-term significance for increasing the threat to the control of the North Korean government. The third, uh, the third major misconception that a lot of people have, and, and the, the international media has, about North Korea is that <coughs> Pyongyang controls a totalitarian police state uh, that has complete control over the people. Right? This is a very common uh, thought that people have about North Korea. Of course, this is true in certain ways. North Korea, the you know, North Korean regime, does have complete control over public politics. You can't come out and criticize the North Korean government uh, at, a, at a political level. You know, there's no known dissidents inside the country. There's no North Korean Aung San Suu Kyi or uh, Liu Xiaobo or Ai Weiwei or those kind of people. There's no dissidents inside the country. However, the North Korean government does not control all of the people's lives uh, at a local level, especially on economic and information areas. And the reason why they can't control uh, the people's lives using an effective police state is because North Korea is probably one of the most corrupt countries in the world. It's amazingly corrupt. And this is, you know, if you look at uh, the kind of factors that lead to corruption, it's kind of obvious why North Korea's uh, government is so corrupt. It's a huge government. Government officials are very poorly paid. You know, it's a huge bureaucracy. Of course, there's massive barriers to business. Uh, the, those businesses are illegal but very profitable. And so you have this burgeoning uh, market sector which is operating in gray and black areas and government officials who have a lot of arbitrary power and no accountability, so corruption is absolutely inevitable, and it's rampant. North Korean refugees consistently tell us that if you have money in North Korea, then you can do anything. Uh, and if, if people are interested, then uh, I can give you some price data on that uh, as well, like how many dollars does it, does it take to pay for a travel permit to visit Pyongyang, for instance. I think that's actually about uh, 15, 16 dollars, um, or you know, for instance, if you get caught watching South Korean foreign media in your house, these bribes vary a lot, but it could be, for instance, 300 to $500 to pay your way out of that. And it's absolutely possible to pay your way out of all that kind of trouble. The significance of that is that corruption, of course, we often think of it as a bad thing because the corruption is the, you know, a subversion of the rule of law. But in North Korea, the rule of law does not protect the public good. It protects the ruling elite. So the, the uh, breakdown of rule of law can open up positive space for the people to operate outside of those restrictions and create change inside the country. This, again, is a long-term trend. The North Korean government is not going to uh, bring, uh, bring this under control without changing their system, without basically opening up and reforming their system. And, and in the long run, this is another source of threat to the government's control over their society. The fourth uh, major misconception is that North Korea is a so-called hermit kingdom, and all of the North Korean people are brainwashed. They're all incredibly loyal to the state, they don't know anything about the outside world, and these kind of things. Again, since the 1990s, this is increasingly not the case. First of all, you have a lot of population flows, really significant population flows, both cross-border uh, between North Korea and China, people going to China and coming back as well, uh, including for trade reasons, both legal and illegal trade, regular and irregular work going uh, back and forth, and also North Korean refugees who have gone into China and then been caught and sent back. And when all of these people come back, which is you know, uh, over 100,000 people that have been to China, seen with their own eyes and come back to North Korean society, they talk and they say what they've learned about uh, China and, and through China, what they've learned about the outside world. Add to that the new information technologies, which have been, again, coming in uh, significantly over the last 10 years. This includes DVD players, uh, the DVDs, USBs, and USBs can be played on those USB, uh, sorry, the USBs can be played on the DVD players as well. Uh, they have also the portable DVD players. Uh, laptops are increasing these days. The latest stuff is even the SD cards and micro SD cards that are being used to share and consume foreign media. This is increasingly happening inside the country. This is, of, of course, highly illegal and risky. However, again, 
you know, people find ways to get around that. Uh, one of the reasons why USBs became more popular than DVDs is, well, obviously, USBs are just easier to put in your pocket and walk around. Nobody wants to carry around this disk that might break. But also, uh, one of the ways that North Korean authorities try to crack down on people watching foreign media on DVDs is that they would go into the residential units, shut off the power, and then bust into people's houses and check the DVD players. And if, if the power was shut off, then your DVD would be stuck in the DVD player. However, with these newer US uh, DVD players that are coming in from China, they cost about $15 to $20 in the North Korean markets. So if you have a bit of money, then you can afford it. Uh, with those, it has a USB input port. So even if the authorities turn off the power, you can just take the USB out of the uh, socket and then throw it out of the window or hide it somewhere, and it's very small. And so that's one of the ways that uh, people are overcoming that. Also, one of the reasons, you know, even though it's risky for people to consume foreign media, one of the reasons why people are doing that is because the North Korean domestic media is so horrifically, terribly bad, right? It's really boring. You know, again, North <laughs> Korean refugees, especially younger North Korean refugees, say that they basically never watch the North Korean state channel. Most North Koreans only have access to one television channel anyway. Uh, and it's obviously full of, you know, propagandistic films. If you watch the first five minutes, you know how it's going to end. <laughs> it's going to end with... North Korea beating America, and uh, you know people making great sacrifices for the cause of the socialist revolution, uh, and all of these kind of things. It's not really realistic. It doesn't relate to your own life. And also, you know, the the news is not really news. It's just yet another you know Kim Jong Il or Kim Jong Un visiting the military or a factory or something like that. There's only so much of that that one person can take, right? <laughs> so. People are very motivated to seek out alternative sources of entertainment, and that includes uh, significantly Chinese dramas and films and South Korean dramas and films. Just to uh, touch on briefly the understanding of China, because I think that's really significant. China, the North Korean people understand that China used to be poorer than uh, North Korea until relatively recently, until even the 1980s. North Korea was richer on a per capita basis. However, they know through all sorts of ways, including these ways that I mentioned, that China is racing ahead. And increasingly, they understand why that's happened. They understand that China used to have a similar system to their own, but they've reformed, opened up, accepted foreign technology, increased cooperation and trade with the outside world, and that's how they're improving their economy. This is a really significant and potentially really obviously, obviously subversive lesson to the North Korean people. Uh, the fifth and last major misconception that people have is that North Korea is a tragedy, but it's impossible, and it's hopeless, and there's not that much we can do about it. We might feel sad, we might hear about these reports of intense uh, human suffering in North Korea, but there's not that much that we can do. This, is, this again, is a misconception because of what's really happening inside the society, what's happening from the North Korean people, and the changes that I've just mentioned, and there's several other uh, changes that maybe we can get to in the Q&A session. The, the fact that the North Korean people are driving these bottom-up changes presents us with opportunities to support those changes. So we've mentioned increasing information flows. I'll mention briefly the role that we can uh, play supporting North Korean refugees, because that's one of the things that our organization does. North Korean refugees, when they leave uh, into China, they can't go directly to South Korea because the DMZ is in the way. They go into China, and they still face the danger of being caught and sent back or being exploited while they're in China because they have no status. We can uh, you know, identify these people and bring them through China and Southeast Asia uh, through these you know, secret kind of rescue routes that we use and bring them to safe and free resettlement in South Korea or other countries. The significance of that then is not just that we're helping those individual lives, but it's that we're helping people who are agents of change even in their own homeland. So uh, to go to it briefly, Zambia and Benin have a similar per capita GDP to North Korea. South Korea's per capita GDP is more similar to Israel, New Zealand, or actually the EU average. So if you imagine people jumping the fence from, imagine Zambia being right next to the EU and people jumping the fence and then working in the EU, sending money back home, sending information back home, being in direct phone contact with their family members if they're in the border regions, that can be, that can be a really significant role in helping to open up North Korean society from the inside as well. Help, that money helps to accelerate the positive marketization which is happening in North Korean society. 
And so this is one of the things that we can do to actually help not just North Korean refugees, but help people back in North Korea as well and promote change inside the country. So the conclusion would be that I think that the international community and, uh, and probably a lot of us have been blindsided by this massive focus on a securitized and politicized view of North Korea, Crazy Kim and nukes. We've been blindsided by that. That has made us miss the North Korean people and the really significant changes that the North Korean people are, are driving. And so, uh, it, and the result of that is that very realistic, pragmatic, and feasible strategies that we can uh, bring to play to try and support change in North Korea are under-resourced. They've been, they've been missed, basically, uh, up until this point. So, whilst this is probably one of the biggest challenges facing humanity today, we can do something about it. And we can all be a part of supporting the North Korean people, standing alongside them, and doing simple people-to-people -people things that can bring forward progress in North Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Sakir. And the nuclear weapons. So now I live in Britain, this is in England. So people sometimes ask me, where you come from? So I said, uh, my co I come from North Korea. They just said, oh, this is a younger leader, Kim Jong-un, or just nuclear weapons. And uh, they nothing to know this about North Korea. So uh, first time, just ask, I just explained what is North Korea. So North Korea has got uh, two bodies. Uh, what, two bodies, first body, this is a political body, and uh, Second body is just normal, just a human body. So the political body is uh, just a uh, Korea Workers' Party member. That is a political just is a body. So North Korea regime said is uh, if you have got just only normal uh, human body when you die, just grab anyway. We don't know. But so you got the just is a political body. We just member it all forever anyway. So um, before it's my country, people just worked very hard. They wanted to go to the, this is political board. And the second is my country has got the Songbun system. So this is a Songbun system. Is a, I explain just a simple. Just a, when here, this is a, uh, children go to the high school. They just level is a high level and the middle class and the low class. That is my country Songbun system. Just low, uh, high and the middle and the uh, low class, that is Songbun system. And the uh, uh, second, third is uh, my country had no rule is can't believe anyone. Because uh, uh, I think is, uh, if uh, me and you three, is, uh, uh, you met the 20 years or 30 years, so I think is, uh, you are my best friend. So something I said today, um, just uh, Kim Jong-un is something wrong, that's just I said a little bit. Uh, tomorrow I go to the prison camp. So I don't know who said you or you just is said politics is a police. I don't know. So we can't believe the anyone in my country. And the um, first one is uh, my country is uh, not to have um, freedom of speech and uh, movement and not have belief. This one. And the uh, uh, last one is uh, brainwashed. This is brainwashed when you birth. This is North Korea said to cut off to this is abroad. They just only say this in my country is the greatest country in the world, in the earth, and uh, uh, very strong, and uh, we have got nothing to envy. That is my country. So this one is every day, every hour, every minute, when you birth and uh, when you life all day, we just say that is brain worthy. So this is my country, it's normal life. So I think it's my country is just big, big, this is prison camp. So all North Korean people is just prisoner in life is in prison. So I just said a little, my experience. Uh, I was born in Chongjin in Hamgyong, this is a province the, near the board, Chinese board. So uh, I, I, was, I was just brainwashed every day when I was. So, I just cut up the abroad. I watched just only one channel, and uh, I just learning the every day. This is my legion, and my country is strong, strong. So I just uh, get the 
not information just abroad, or sometimes the little information just on your bad thing. Some is South Korea, just is something, and the USA is something. And the just always the watch the TV and the newspaper and the learning everything is just my country regime, just regime work. Um, but in North Korea is uh, mid 1990s, this is a uh, just economic crisis and the food stop. And the, the 1997 to 1998, one year just paper died, three million paper just hunger died. So last time is a lot many paper just escaped North Korea, but at that time they not wanted the freedom, just wanted one meal just in China and wanted just is one meal and uh, they just um, earn money to China and uh, bring the them in North Korea, save the family. So that time is uh, lots of North Korean women escaped uh, in China because uh, the 1990s, the lot, lots of women lost the day job in North Korea and uh, they care about the children and the family, but they haven't got much money. So every day just family member died in front of this paper and the children wanted to just please one meal, I wanted to just one corn, one potato every day. So, so mother is painful, just painful, so they just earned money in China. But that time broker said this, if you, you go to the, in China, just a care worker, so whole housekeeper, you earn the money and to them, this is North Korea, just you saved your family. So lots of women is wanted this work. So they escaped to China, but it's in China broker, just trafficking the women in Chinese man. So I was trafficking the in Chinese, so I sold the 500 pound in China to the farmer. But when you, they just said you married a Chinese man, but this is not normal marriage to trafficking. The Chinese, Chinese people, when they just sold the North Korean women, they first time said, you are not human. You just slavery. We just is, uh, take, uh, just give the money and I bought to you. So I just said, uh, you what do think, what something you, you must do this. And uh, all this is Chinese paper said is, uh, if you escape to this home, uh, we just say to call police or we just is uh, naked to you. Every, just they say it very scary and the, <laughs> I couldn't explain that. Yet yeah, this is uh, all North Korean uh, women's life in China. But uh, this uh, woman is uh, just most painful. Is they want to earn money and uh, it behind in North Korea, just children waiting the mother when my mother come and give me the one potato on one course. But this is very painful, but this woman is just trapping that they didn't give the money and they didn't save the, this family. And uh, this is a very painful story. And one, another one is, uh, this is uh, when North Korean men trafficked in China, they have got chosen. But the Chinese government didn't, don't give the, this chosen name and ID card because uh, this is, uh, Chinese man and this is North Korean woman, this is different nationality, so Chinese government don't give this name. So nowadays 20,000 20, children in China, they haven't got the name, they can't go to school, they can't work, just, and in the road, this is open children there. Uh, and when this is North Korean woman repatriated in North Korea, in North Korea prison, they do this work every day, every very, very hard. And they do this, if North Korean women do this traffic in China, they go to the normal prison camp. And this is all paper, or, or some paper is contact size South Korean paper or church paper. They just go to the prison camp over three or five years in the camp. But at that time, North Korean paper, not to uh, think about just political, just only they want to do one meal, but it's North, if they go to the North Korea, they just, uh, this is too much, uh, give too much to just execute. 
uh, and uh, some women is trafficking the, in China and the day after got repatriated in North Korea, some women is a pregnant baby. But it's uh, North Korea don't want to this baby because uh, it's uh, just a Chinese man and the North Korean just is a uh, uh, mixed baby. And the uh, North Korean symbol is, uh, North Korea is brainwashed when you burst just every year, every time. So, but uh, this is a mixed baby. So they just, uh, when women pregnant, uh, just uh, they worked very hard when this baby is miscreated. And uh, some, some women is uh, eight months or nine months, they just is, uh, kill the baby in front of mother. Yeah. So North Korea just province, just doctors say this, uh, North Korea has got food, so we can't eat uh, the, just is a poison father's child, so we must kill this baby. This is now still in North Korea's uh, human right. And uh, uh, now is, uh, it changed just as a political body and brainwashed because uh, uh, to before, to, uh, I think middle 20, 2000, this paper got the, some information, which is uh, who first went to the South Korea, this family give the some South Korea information and they, they listen to the radio. So they understand that this is abroad and uh, understand in North Korea. So they, nowadays they don't want to do this political body. This is, they want this the money, this is the money is a good thing, yeah. And the brain was is a, a little bit changed because younger children now is a can't go to school. They just is want to do, just market on money. So brain was is different before this is mid 1990s. So but it's still just some system, can't believe the anyone and not freedom. This is still this is North Korea. So um, before is, I, under, I didn't understand what is freedom, what is happiness, what is love, I can't understand. But now I understand that this is freedom and happiness and love and what is woman and what is mother's life, I understand now. So I wanted to give, this is my hope, my happiness is to give to just my Korean people, North Korean women and children. So uh, this one is uh, my voice and uh, why I work, uh, this is North Korean human rights. Thank you very much.